Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Kathleen Newman, Manager of Education and Public Programs at Maine Historical Society. Uh, today is Thursday, July 23rd, uh, 2020, and uh, we've just finished a screening of Maine's Home Movies, and now we are here for our discussion with the filmmaker, Sean Evans. Uh, now, Sean, I want to introduce you properly, is the founder of Farthest Films Smash Inc. And is it the, the F Film Company? Yeah, multiple names. Okay. <laughs> um, and she has worked as a director and a producer since 1981, writing and directing her own essay documentaries, many of which explore the influence of the child's perspective. She works extensively with home movies, which embody a sense of the private, the domestic, and the uniqueness of place. Um, and that was the case, certainly, with this film, um, Maine's Home Movies, Treasures from Northeast Historic Films. So thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening, Sean, and for sharing the film with us. Thank you for having me. So I don't know if, uh, if, um, if you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and about your work. And of course, um, we'd love to hear more about historic film uh, as well. I've been a commercial producer in the documentary field for about 30 years. I've made films for the United Nations. I've made films for Pfizer. I've made all kinds of films. I've worked for Barbara Koppel, who's one of the most important documentary filmmakers in the United States. Um, but I've always made my personal films. And my family's from Maine. And I, when I came back, decided I wanted to move back to Maine and live in, and, and really settle in Maine and have my family. Um, I discovered Northeast Historic Films, which is a, a nonprofit um, archive theater, the Alamo Theater, and um, and they also do technical services for films up in Bucksport. And they specialize, they're one of the few institutions in the country that specializes in collecting amateur films and home movies which is my personal interest in my, in my private work. Um, so I went over there and I pitched them for a project. And um, eventually I realized that this was too big a thing for us, but they invited me onto their board. This was about 25 years ago and I've been, been working with them ever since. I love them. And they're doing something that really, it's pretty amazing. Um, there's no other institution like them in the United States. There's one or two in Europe. There's, there's somebody in, in Holland that's supported by the government. Um, and they have, 10 million feet of film sitting in a state-of-the-art archive up there in Bucksport that nobody knows about. And um, I'm happy to be on the board and give them uh, hundreds of hours of my time because then I have an excuse to go in and putter around, look at all their footage. So <clears throat> to get to Maine's Home Movies, I knew that the Bicentennial was coming up and I had a, a working relationship with some people over at uh, Maine Public and I said, could we do a program for you to celebrate the bicentennial. And they were really excited about that. And I had been pushing Northeast Historic Film to do something for years, but they have no money. I mean, they're just a nonprofit. They're not supported by anybody. So, except for individual donations. Hold on one second. I can't talk to you right now. Okay. Sorry, as a child. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> two of them. There's another one that'll come in a minute. It happens. <laughs> so, uh, so I had been bugging them, but it takes a lot of money to make a film. Mm -hmm. And, but this was a really good excuse to sit down and I went out and fundraised and I was able to pay NHF for all the footage that we used, every piece that was transferred. And I spent about three or four years working with David Weiss, who's the, um, the director of NHF, talking to him about what we would want to show people if we had just a little bit of time, an hour. He understood that I was going to amplify the films and condense them and, and, and change them. And archivists don't like that. That's really not their thing. You're supposed to cut it. You're not supposed to manipulate it. Um, and I don't know if, uh, if you realized when you watched the piece, but we heavily, we worked on it for about a year. We really worked on it. We really changed things, but because we wanted people to have a, um, um, a really strong reaction to the materials. So, yeah, um, I know um, one of the things I, I noticed and was wondering about uh, was, it, it felt, um, and I mean, I, I think this really helped, but it felt like you probably added sound to a lot of the film to kind of make it come to life. I didn't know if there were part, some parts that had been colorized or did you keep those as they were originally, what was black and white stayed black and white? It was never it colorized, <laughs> never. <laughs> that's, that's too far. <laughs> oh, never colorized. Um, but you know, film as it gets aged, 
depending upon the type of film it is and how it's being stored, a lot of these films were stored in people's basements and attics and barns and you know things happen right. go through 50 or 60 winters in Maine um, and the colors sometimes get warped. We, the only thing we did do, we, tr we had these transferred, NHF is really interesting. They have, they had a, a wonderful grant given to them by a single foundation to buy a very high-end German transfer machine, it cost about $150,000, but it allows them to do gorgeous transfers from these, you know, these films, a lot of them are super eight, the frame is this big and they're transferring them to 2K, which is, it's huge, it's huge. And so that allowed us to zoom in sometimes, so, okay, but not a lot. We just did it when we felt like, you know, the original filmmaker was shooting a whole landscape and I want you to see this person, but mm. we didn't do it a lot. We, I will, I will tell you, we did all the sound. There's yes. none of it's on the film. <laughs> <laughs> Because sound is, I mean, I work with home movies in my personal work, but I also, I always tell people sound and music is 70% of everything that I, in my personal pieces. Um, I just think it's what pulls you in and, and makes you feel and speaks to you. And so we, we created sound effects. Like there was a writer from the bang, um, in Portland from the Herald who said, oh, I love the sound of that beer can. I'm like, well, that's not a beer can. <laughs> But we spent hours and hours and hours making sounds, but we had to be selective because they didn't have a big budget. Um, I, I want to also add that everyone, everyone who worked on this is from Maine. I, I was really adamant that the money had to stay in Maine. And the collections are all have some connection to Maine. NHF takes collections in full. So it might be somebody whose family has been in Maine for 10, you know, seven generations, or it might be, no, and those films, or it might be somebody who's summers, who's summered here for, you know, two, two or three generations and the kids are selling the house and they don't want these films anymore. And they heard about Northeast Historic Films, so they gave them to them. Um, and in that case, it might be, we've often seen this, uh, there's, um, it might be something, somebody's travels in Bermuda or they're, they're 10 years living in China. You know, there's just great weird things. And, and HF is, very, works by very pure arch archivist standards. So they, they collect and preserve. They don't edit, they don't curate. Mm. I do that. <laughs> right, right. But they would never cut out that Chinese stuff. If that's part of the collection, they keep all of it. Interesting. So it's not, I had a question that I think you have already spoken to a little bit. Was there anything specific that inspired this particular project? It sounds like the bicentennial, you know, Maine marking its 200th year of statehood um, may have been something of an inspiration. Was there anything else in particular? Is it just your love of Maine and home movies or? Well, I think that amateur film is far more interesting than anything I've ever shot with anybody because and I've shot all <laughs> over the world for all kinds of people. But and I mean, I've shot in Ethiopia and Iraq. I mean, I've been every China. I've been in 1980s. I've been everywhere. And amateur films, is, which is what they call films, made, home movies, it, the sincerity of the vision is so much stronger than mm. any part of this that we can make up, even when there's not even sound. And I always say to people, you see love. You see love when a woman films her kids in their Easter clothes on mm -hmm. the front lawn. <laughs> <laughs> you see that and you see her or his, it's often the woman behind the camera, you see the connection and you see the same thing. I mean, a lot of people in Maine are really proud of like of places. And I, I wrote, I, I try to write about that in the descriptions of this film for people because people outside of Maine don't really understand this as much. We really like, we all know, you know, what Jordan Pond looks like. We all know what uh, Pemaquid Point looks like at low tide. And it's like the secret information, but it's our places. And, um, and, and you see that on constantly. People go out and shoot their field. Um, and uh, so that was, that was what I wanted to do was sort of capture what people in Maine would be interested in seeing and what would really say Maine, because I think a lot of it's timeless. I think that the places are the same and I think that when you see someone you love or, or you or, or are looking at a place that you know, something of that's communicated. And I've had a lot of people tell me that it's, it's that it, um, it feels like they're still alive. Those mm -hmm. people are still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to remind folks uh, that are joining us. If you have any questions for Sean, you can type them into the chat feature or into the Q and a feature, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, while we're waiting, if other folks have questions, I have a couple more. Um, so a project like this, you know, with, with Northeast Historic Film, and, and it sounds like they have such a 
um, an extensive archive. How did you choose what, what to include in a project like this? So I could make 20 films. <laughs> Yeah. Seriously. And there were a lot of, there were a lot of conversations because, you know, you do have these collections that are just summer people. And so you kind of like, how do we balance that? And, um, and so there's some, there were some considerations like that. And I've, I've often thought, you know, I could make a whole hour on just summer, the people from away and what mm -hmm. they're experiencing. And, and it would be beautiful and it would be fun to watch. But I, um, so I try to balance that. I try to, give a sense of it because it's so much in the collection. There are a lot of collections like that, but, but I was like, we try to do place cover sort of all parts of the state. I will admit that my mother's, my family's from Millinocket and I was like, I'm going to get Millinocket in here. Millinocket in there. <laughs> what a story about Millinocket. So where I'm zooming, I go through the database and I'm pulling stuff up and looking at it and I'm zooming through and I go, stop, roll back. Let me see that again. <laughs> and I look at this man on the street that I know is in Millinocket and I'm going, I think that's my great grandfather who I've never met. And I oh, wow. picture. And I took I took a frame grab and sent it to my that's him and I realized, oh, okay, so now what he looks like. And I actually, I stuck him in there a couple times. He's in a couple places in there, which is which was a really nice thing. And I mean, I didn't know this, but it was shot by somebody else. And you know, that's what happens. People say, oh, there was a woman uh, called NHF after we screened on it. I mean, public and said, that's my father. He died when I was really young. I think he's, he's in the E.B. White footage. And there was a, a, there were a series of handymen that were sort of involved with the E.B. White family because it was a, a real working farm and there was a lot of maintenance and, uh, and farm work. And her father had really been a, pers a presence on the farm and he was in a bunch of shots and we, he was painting, painting a boat. <laughs> and so we, you know, copied the clip and asked for permission from the family. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've got a lot of stories like that. Um, so the E.B. White footage that, I don't know, I mean, for me, that was probably the most recognizable name um, in the, uh, in the film. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Do we know who was the person behind the camera there? And do we know the names of any of the people in that footage? So the E.B. White family, um, Martha, I believe her name is White, but I could be wrong. There's a woman in the family who sort of manages the estate. And she has been so wonderful to Northeast Historic Film. And she gave the family home movies to NHF to preserve them, not to use them. I mean, NHF is it's a absolutely pristine archive. They, they, they fill out deed of gifts with everybody who gives and the, the giver can stipulate how it can be used. And, you know, no, you can't sell it. Yes, you can sell it. Yes, you can sell it if I let you. Or no, nobody can ever see it, whatever. There's all kinds of stipulations. Mm -hmm. but. They're very careful to preserve that uh, as, as a real archive should be. But uh, the E.B. White family has um, gave them the films to preserve them. They gave them his projector. And wow. the, so we knew about the collection and a couple of times they've done events with Martha and she will s show them um, the films and talk about them. So these are literally the home movies. They are all shot almost every minute, I, I know them very well, has been sh were shot by E.B. White. And this wow. is a very interesting thing about E.B. White. He, it, and this is what's so great about amateur films, you can tell he writes stories because he only films what he loves. He doesn't construct, it's not constructed. He's like, I love my child, I love mm -hmm. my wife, I love my, you know, my writing shed, I love boats, and Every time he, and he loves his farm animals. And every time he sits down, he just watches. He doesn't tell anybody what to do. He's no, there's no direction. He just watches and something happens. And it's like, how did he do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, like a, gifted, a gifted storyteller, whatever his medium, whether it's- Great observer. The camera. Yeah. Just great. And we get, like, if he's shooting the ducklings, he gets low with the ducklings. Yeah. Yeah. No, and it's real, and he loved his dog, but it, it, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful films. And I would, you know, we we're very careful. Uh, Martha gave us per explicit permission. We asked her specifically, because we don't like to take advantage of, the, of their name, but at the same sure. time, so you can see, we're not, we're trying not to say, this is E.B. White. <laughs> we right, really want right. to tell a story about the, fun, the saltwater right. one. And I think it's beautiful. I love that one. Yeah, that was, it was one of my, my favorite segments. Um, Speaking of favorite segments, I mean, did you have a personal favorite? Was it was it the Millinocket pieces or something else? Um, 
I love everything. I, you know, I, what I really love is there were many, because they're home movies, there's many instances where people, I call it the gaze, they'll look at the camera and they're not looking mm -hmm. at the camera, they're looking at the person behind the camera. And sometimes they know them and sometimes somebody behind the camera is going, say, say hi or whatever. Um, but I love that. I love that, in, you know, that moment of engagement. And, you know, we constructed a beginning and an end of those moments. Mm -hmm. And I just, something about that transports me. I, can just I know there was some footage I remember of like a woman, you know, she takes her glasses off and then she kind of puts them back on again. So you get, you can sort of, tell you know someone behind the camera is is asking her to to do something you know what what exactly are they directing her to do i'm, I'm not really sure um but yeah i really liked uh the mom moments like that too i thought were really and it great. again it's like the character of the filmmaker the person filming comes through and when you watch that footage this is a man who's with his family went and he went he took a trip down to Washington DC and he stopped in a couple towns on the way and they would go in, they went into like the commerce department. He had somebody, some friend who was in the commerce department and they would go in and he would ask people to stand up against the wall and just, he would just film them and he would sort of say, say hi. And so, you know, like, and some of them were shy and some of them were mm -hmm. giggling and some of them were playing with them and they're all, and he's just has, that man has so much fun. And then I used a bunch of his footage of dancing and it's, it's, he's in the middle, he's on the dance floor and he's da he's filming his friends dancing like 40 sort of couples dancing. Yes. And everybody's laughing and teasing him and you know making jokes and it's just beautiful. And it's him, he's, I, I have actually seen him for like one second in, one, in the footage with some, the, the donors identified him, but it's, it's him, it's his personality that's coming through. Yeah, so. and it's interesting to me too how I don't know how natural everybody seemed or felt like for a time when, you know, being in front of a, ca a camera, like a, a movie camera, especially must have been quite a, a novelty or, 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 or very rare. Just, I don't know how comfortable and how natural everybody seemed and just how much fun they were, they were all having whenever the camera was on them. There's a lot of fun. And that was one of the logging words that I used. Um, that mm -hmm. I said, I told my editor, we could do 20 minutes on leapfrogging because in the 30s, the 30s, the 30s, and 40s, everybody's leapfrogging. Yeah. Adults, yeah. children. <laughs> I mean, I, maybe they're all drunk and they're carousing. I don't know, but it's just hilarious. It's like constantly people are, let's do some leapfrogging. <laughs> Lots of people yeah. dancing and frolicking. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, yeah, it's just that, that sense of fun. It's just interesting to me. It, it comes through in every in every era and in all of these all of this footage. Now you said um, that what was it that the sounds make up something like seventy percent of, of what we're experiencing? How did you choose? Um, of course, this is all. I mean, it's it's silent film. Obviously, you, you said you added sound effects to kind of make it come to life. How did you choose um, the the music that you hear while you're watching? What goes into those types of choices? So we had um, some considerations for money because you're licensing, mm -hmm. and so I had to be careful with that. Um, so what uh, I went through a lot of libraries, sound libraries, and what we found worked. There's a I, the the description I gave the editor was I said this is a film about ghosts, so we're not trying to lead the watcher we're trying to let what the filmmaker is showing us lead us mm -hmm. but 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 it but we need to give it mood so so there was a theme for each one and what i found was that there were two or three there were probably four composers that just always had the right touch they just had the right way with music and so that's really how we you know i mean the, the, technically what you do is you get in the library you turn on the cut you play the cut, you play the music, and you see if yeah, they work. <laughs> if it matches. <laughs> right, and then I hand it, well, it's for mood, and then I hand it to the editor, and he, you know, he finesses and says, I'm going to move it over here, and I'm only going to use it there, whatever, but. So but is it's, this, it's was anything like original composed for this, or was this, this was all, oh, no. no? No, these are all, these are all available for licensing, okay. but they're all, you know, they're not um, industrially, industrial. These are people who are, you know, com trying to make a living composing. Sure, and put up sure. The Mm -hmm. A lot of more very young. Remind our attendees um, be before we wrap up that um, just ask if anybody has any questions for Sean. 
um, about this film or about her work, um, feel free to type that question in the, in the chat feature um, or in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So I'm curious, uh, Sean, um, what are you working on next? Like what's your, your next big project? Is it something else Maine related or, or something outside of Maine? Um, well, I have a lot of clients that I, and I work on their films and they're all over the place. I have a client in Tokyo. We just finished shooting in Spain, London, and Tokyo on remotely. <laughs> we bought them all cameras. Yeah. Wow. We, we had them buy wardrobe and lay all their clothes out. We had them rearrange their apartments. We had them caution their neighbors they were going to make some noise. So that was interesting. Um, but I, uh, the project that I have two projects that I'm working on right now myself privately. And one is about children's, what children see when they see someone who's drunk, what they think of drunken behavior because they've never been drunk. Yeah. Um, and so, and I, and this is like all my other pieces, it's working with, people now but it's also working with footage because a lot of people are drunk on the old home movies so it's like really right. interesting when you <laughs> yeah. contrast it and i'm actually working with um and there's a, there's a fair amount keep pointing this way because that's what boxport is across the nops cafe um but i i actually use nhf as a resource and i license material from them so i've, I've been you know that's a very slow project um, but, and I, I, so I work with footage in Maine for that. And I actually shot all, all the interviews in Maine for that as well. Um, and I've been trying to finish a piece for quite a long time. I lived in Williamsburg, Brooklyn in the 70, late seventies and eighties when, before all the kids came, all the, and it was really a um, Polish neighborhood. You had to speak Polish when you went to the stores. And I want to, people always think that, you know, it became this hot little neighborhood in Brooklyn in the nineties. And I'm like, no, there were people that were here before. <laughs> So I've been trying to work on that piece because I think it's, it'll be interesting for people to see. But I'm really, um, I, I'm really so grateful. I just want to say this to the Historical Society. It's been a wonderful partner to Northeast Historic Film, and um, a, it's a great collaboration. And I'm, I'm really pleased that you're showing this film. Oh well, thank you. So we really appreciate um, your generosity and letting us do this screening and uh, with your time this evening for this discussion. Where can folks go if they want to learn more about Northeast Historic Film and where can they go? Is there any place else um, that you're going to be showing the film later this year that people can see it or learn more about it? What can you tell us? So that's a little complicated because we're in the middle yeah. of a huge disruption. Yes. Um, and there are no theaters and they're not going to be open for a long time because it's not safe. Yeah. And we talk about a, a lot um, on the board about the Alamo, but we know it's not safe. Yeah. So there are some film festivals and people trying out drive-ins, but this isn't a long enough piece. You know, people, when they get mm -hmm. there, it's a different hour and a half and an hour isn't really enough. So I'm not, um, I've submitted to a couple festivals that, that are doing drive-ins, so it may get in there, but we were supposed to do um, 12 theaters. We, I had lined up to screen in the independent theaters around the state of Maine that that could show non-Hollywood features. Mm -hmm. And literally two weeks before it really became apparent. So yeah. I have the, the $2,000 print that I would need to screen in theaters, but it's gonna probably be at least a year before people will go back in the theaters. I'm, sure. I feel pretty certain that the main theaters will show it, but it's gonna be a year. In the meantime, it is, Northeast Historic Film has put it up on um, Vimeo. And if you Google Vimeo main film movies, or just even look at the, um, North, Northeast Historic Films website, you can get to it. It's old film, www.oldfilm.org. So, and I think it's $2.99 to watch it there if, you, if anybody wants to watch it. You, you can also purchase a DVD if you want from NHF. I made the film for them, I worked for free, um, but I raised the money to pay the, the, the uh, animator and the editor, and we paid in full for everything that we took or licensed from NHF. Excellent. And um, I will say too, you know, again, this, we really appreciate uh, being able to do this. We appreciate your time for this discussion. Um, Maine Historical Society is always um, uh, happy and grateful for, for our friendship and our partnership with Northeast Historic Film. Um, they are a contributing partner to our online database, Maine Memory Network. So if you haven't had a chance yet to visit Maine Memory Network, um, you can do that at mainmemory.net. Um, and I know there are lots of things from the uh, archive, Northeast Historic Film, that you can see on Main Memory Network, things that weren't necessarily included in this film. Um, so please uh, 
uh, check out our database. It's a great resource, and, and NEH is a great resource for Maine. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much, uh, Sean, for this. Uh, it was a beautiful film. This was a great experience. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. And um, I hope that we'll all see each other back here again uh, for another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. We have a lot of great stuff coming up. Visit our website, mainhistory.org. You can see recordings of past programs, and you can also stay up to date on what's coming up for our programming. So thank you all, and uh, thank you, Sean, for being here this evening. Oh, I do have one question um, before we go from a participant. Jesse's asking, um, about picking films that you include, do you think that you're playing a role in shaping how we see Maine in choosing the films you feel like you were influenced by your personal view of Maine? I think that's actually a good question for us to go out on. So we wanted our, we were very conscious of trying to be, to cast the widest net for the people of Maine. So we wanted to show something that would be interesting to young people to old people, to people in the north, to people in the south, to people who come to Maine for the summer. But our our interest, we really tried hard. We wanted to go for the human, but we wanted to show films that people would identify, the people in Maine would identify with. That said, of course, everything I do is manipulation. Everything an editor does is manipulation. I think that NHF would tell you, we're archivists, you people are artists. You know, like there's a really strong line between, mm -hmm. but we do choose everything. You know, we, we worked for a year cutting, manipulating, changing. So yes, there's lots and lots of personal choices. Sure, sure. Well, thank you so much. Again, thank you to all our attendees. Uh, thank you, Sean Evans. And uh, again, hope we'll see each other all back here again soon. Thank you.